So <clears throat> let's talk about new features in new JavaScript release. And uh, going back in history, it will start. It all started with competitions at what was called the browser war. This war, which took place in 90s between Microsoft with Internet Explorer and Netscape Communications with Navigator, marked beginning of the ECMAScript specification. Um, Brendan Eich, the creator of JavaScript, was asked to develop a language that resembled Java. Java was a very popular language then and still is for the web. Eich, however, decided that Java was too complicated with all its rules and so set, set out to create a simpler language that was beginner friendly. He developed a new scripting language in just 10 days. After the JavaScript was complete, the marketing team of Netscape requested some microsystems to allow them to name it JavaScript as a marketing stunt and hence why most people who have never used JavaScript think it's related to Java. About a year and a half after JavaScript's release, Microsoft Internet Explorer team took the language and started making its own implementation known as GS script. Finally, before Netscape went down, they decided to start uh, a standard that would guide the path of JavaScript. So ECMAScript can be seen as a language whereas JavaScript, JS script and other are called dialects. And uh, just fun fact that A, the creator of language commented that, that ECMAScript was always an unwanted trade name that sounds like a skin disease. And uh, in 1997, due to, due, due to JavaScript's rapid growth, it became clear that the language would need to be properly maintained and, and managed. Therefore, Netscape handed the job of creating a language specification to the European Computer Manufacturers Associations, ECMA, a body founded with the goals of standardizing computing. So the specifications were labeled as ECMA 264 and uh, ECMAScript languages include JavaScript, JS script, and ActionScript. And between 97 and 99, uh, language had three revisions. Then the year 2005 proved to be a big one for JavaScript. A paper introduced Ajax as the rev revolutionary suite of technologies that include JavaScript. Ajax vastly improved user experience by allowing web pages to feel more like native desktop apps. Following 2008 event in Oslo, the ECMAScript 4 proposals were scaled back by many organizations and parties involved with JavaScript, including Yahoo, Google, and Microsoft. Interestingly, many of these controversial features, such as generators, iterators, and structuring assignments have been included in more recent ECMAScript specifications. So how does it work? Uh, so how JavaScript is developing? ECMAScript 5 included a set of the most common features and it was only in the 2050 release that lots of features were introduced and the releases became annual. Why? Because a huge release is full of bugs and there are lots of simple features with simple development that had to remain unreleased until the other parts were ready. At the same time, there was huge pressure on the developers to work faster and it resulted in poor code quality. This is when a group of tech enthusiastic form at the committee called TC39 to decide what will be included in the next ECMAScript releases. How does it take place? There are five stages from, from submitting ideas to the actual unit test. So, and, and 
let's elaborate on the stages of the process. Stage zero, straw person. This is the first stage called straw person, representing an initial idea for adding or change to the specification that isn't considered as a formal proposal. Suggestions for this stage must come from the committee members or registered contributors. And stage one, proposal. This stage is formal proposal that describes a discrete problem or general need, suggests the shape of the solution and points out to potential challenges such as cross-cutting concerns with other features or complex implementation. The solution's description should contain a high-level API with concrete examples and also discuss algorithm, abstractions, and semantics. On top of that, one of the committee members is defined as the owner that is responsible to advance the proposal and practically named champion. Typically, the champion is the origin author of the proposal, but not always. If the proposal meets the criteria of stage one and hereby representing <coughs> the committees, committees will of going forward with the proposal then it moves to the draft stage. So this stage is the initial draft of the proposal in the specification phrased by, by the ECMAScript language. The draft should describe the syntax, semantics, and APIs precisely as much as possible. Also, it can have to-do comments or placeholders. An experimental implementation is also needed, runnable by a browser or a build-time transpiler like Babel. Moving forward from this stage means that the committee expects the proposal would be developed and included eventually in the official specification when only incremen incremental changes and most fixes are expected. Stage three, candidate. This stage is the candidate proposal that almost final but ready for feedback and refinements from implementations and users. The proposal defines as completely final when there is neither further work with the specification for no external feedback. All the ECMAScript editors and designated reviewers should sign off on this specification. In addition, it should include two independent spec-compatible <clears throat> spec implementations passing the acceptance tests. After this stage, changes would be made only for critical issues. And stage four, finished, finished. This is the last stage called finished, obviously, indicating that proposal is ready to, to be included in the latest draft of the specifications and be delivered with its next edition. So, as I said, we have releases of ECMAScript yearly and uh, uh, this year edition is already released. So let's talk about new features. <coughs> Numeric separator. This feature enables developers, developers to make their numeric literals more readable by creating a visual separation between groups of digits. Large numeric literals are difficult for human eye to parse quickly, especially when there are long digit repetitions. This impairs both the ability to get the correct value or order order. So using underscores as separators helps improve readability of numeric literals, both integers and floating point. So we can use numeric literals. Uh, one, one second. Okay, can you go back to the previous slide? Okay. I, I have one like small question. So in the last but one, we can one, two, three, four, five, two zeros, but it looks like it's it's a dot inside. So could you explain this? Uh, so it's financial format. So when you have like uh, cents or like you have, so you can separate this. So the underscore means dot. So it's a floating point. So it's like visual separation, like, you know. But uh, 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 my question is, so in the first variant, in the first row, when we have a billion, yeah, okay. uh, 
Yeah, the underscore is just like a like a space. When we write the big number, we use the underscore to separate uh, three uh, digits, three zeros. But in the last but one example, the underscore means uh, the dot. It's a floating point, so it's a different type. So my question is, how do we know uh, when the underscore is a separator between zeros or it's a dot for the floating point? So actually it's an integer or floating type. So I don't, I don't understand the difference between them. So actually underscore is not a replacement for dot. It's like just indicator. You see, it's like uh, here is one, two, three underscore uh, 45 and double zero. It's like financial format. So it's like uh, you can write I, I, like, you don't understand the question, I think. No, no, so I, understand, I understand the question. So yeah. it's like, it's not like floating. It's like format. You can use like cents or it's financial format. So actually it, you can write it like, uh, you can write here without dot. It's like cents. Okay, let, or... let's, let's postpone it to the end of the presentation. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, Jack, as a suggestion, uh, I guess uh, the one, one underscore is like a dot. Uh, more than one, it's like a separate separator. Just okay, to clarify uh, the question, no. maybe it will be clear. In the example that uh, Flatline Jack asking is that first number is one billion, and one that he's asking is twelve. It's twelve, or it's uh, it looks like one billion, also, or one one million. Sorry, my bad. First number is one billion. And the one that was asking is 1 million, 23, 4, 5, and all these numbers. So it's 1 million. It's not look like 123 at all. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why I... There's a bit of confusion because financial uh, notation here means just a convention of uh, storing uh, numbers without using forwards as integer. So you... Uh, just uh, multiply everything by uh, the amount of decimals that you want to keep. Uh, so it's, uh, I got your point. So it's just integer number. And what we see on the right side is not what it really is. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so. So let's go deeper. So it could be used with regular number literals. Then it could be used with binary literals. And it could be used with hex literals. <clears throat> and also it could be used with big integer literals. Then we have promise any. Promise any accepts an iterable of promises and returns a promise that is fulfilled by the first given promise to be fulfilled or rejects with aggregate error holding the re rejection reasons. Oh, sorry, I need to sip a cup of tea. Is it the same as uh, promise race? No, it's not the same. <clears throat> And what will we have in this situation when first promise is rejected and second one uh, is, uh, uh, is ful fulfilled is correct? So promise any returns the first fulfilled promise. And uh, uh, even if we have rejection with yeah. some of them. Yes. And so the uh, improved, it's improved race. Yeah. Yes. It's improved race. And uh, so, and unlike promise all, which returns an array of fulfillment values, we only get the fulfillment value, only the first one. So this can be beneficial if we need only one promise to fulfill, but we do not care which one does. So, and also unlike promise phrase, which returns the first settled value, this method returns the first first fulfilled value. This method will ignore or 
all rejected promises up until the first promise was that fulfills. And uh, weak ref, which stands for weak references, allow to create a weak reference to an, to an object. A weak reference to an object is a reference that does not prevent the object from being reclaimed by a garbage collector. The primary use of weak reference is to implement caches or mapping of large objects. And uh, finalizer is a companion feature of vcref that allows you to execute some specific code after an object has become unreachable to the program. In short, you can register a callback function that gets triggered after the garbage collection occurs. You can create a, re a registry by passing the callback to the finalization registry. And uh, logical assignment operators. Uh, it's the combination of logical operators and the assignment operator convenient done to the language. Have a look on it. So this one set A to B only when A is truthy. And this one set A to B when A is falsy. This one set A to B only when A is nullish. And uh, uh, if it's uh, A uh, will be undefined, not null. It's the same. It works like with null and uh, undefined. <clears throat> and uh, to replace all string occurrences, we need to use a combination of string prototype replace and global regular expression. And then new method simplifies this, the popularity of question on Stack Overflow proves this feature needs need in the language. So uh, new replace all method does not bring groundbreaking changes, but it's a nice addition. Replace all works like re simple replace. The replace all methods returns a new string with all matches <clears throat> of a pattern replaced by by a replacement. And the uh, pattern can be a string or regular expression and replacement can be a string or a function to be called on for each match. <clears throat> so that's it about all new features, but we have ECMAScript Next and ECMAScript Next is a dynamic name that refers to whatever the next version is at the time of writing. So ECMAScript next features include finished proposals, cast stage four proposals, as listed at finished proposals that are not part of ratified specification. And uh, so what we, what we are waiting in the next year, uh, private methods and fields in this new way of defining class fields, the private ones now can also be defined with uh, hash prefix like the example. This is consistent with the class methods and the accessors declarations. So the private methods and the accessors can be defined with hash prefix. Then we have static public methods and fields. This proposal adds the features of static public fields, static private method fields, and static static private fields to JavaScript classes, building on previous class fields and private methods proposals. These features were created to follow the static aspects of the proposals for class fields and private methods. Okay, can I ask one small question? I think this is already implemented in Chrome, as I remember, at least the uh, private and the static. Correct me if I'm wrong. So, yes, it's implemented because uh, committee follows like live spec uh, specific you know, spec con conception. So it, it could be really, uh, so actually, it's not a part of specification, but it's already done. Yes. 
<coughs> then <coughs> the next feature, top level await. The top level await allows using the await keyword outside async functions. This proposal allows modules to act as large asynchronous functions. So these ECMAScript modules can wait for resources so that other modules that import them have to wait for them before they start executing their own code. And uh, it will it will work without a problem with new proposal, but with old behavior, it will output errors. <clears throat> so uh, when you try to access public field that is not declared in, you simply get undefined. Meanwhile, accessing private fields throws an exception right, right now. Then we can check if a class has a private field by testing if an exception is thrown or not when trying to access it. But this proposal introduces more interesting solution that consists in using in in operator that returns true if a specified property or field is in specified object or class and making working with private fields, as you can see. And the new add method. This proposal is a new array method to get an element by given it by a given index. This new method has the same behavior as accessing with brackets notation when you when the given index is positive. But when we give a negative integer index, it works like uh, Python ne Python's negative indexing, which means that at uh, will, will will the method indexes with negative integers counting back backwards from the last item of the array. So it's a new convenient feature. And, <clears throat> and this proposal adds a object has own method with the same behavior as calling object prototype has own property call function. This new has own methods provides an accessible way to check objects properties more convenient than previous solution so, so sorry it will be just the name of existing no you can you like you can call like uh, has own property dot call it, it's like replacement more suitable replacement mm, okay <clears throat> so that's it for ECMAScript 21. Not a lot of new features, but uh, but the ones that have been accepted looks very good for me. So what do you think about new features, guys? <clears throat> 